Alrighty. That should about do it. Sorry about the delay and lateness this morning, folks. Um, it has been a long morning. A lot of events. One sec, just uh, moving some stuff around here. All right, cat, come on up. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, where did we leave off last week? Let's see. Ah, yes. It's uh, after our first uh, segment with YT, who we don't know the full name of yet, uh, as the focus. Uh, people make their living that way. People in the intel business. People like Hero Protagonist. They just know stuff, or they just go around and videotape stuff. They put it in the library. When people want to know the particular things that they know or watch their videotapes, they pay them money and check it out of the library or just buy it outright. This is a weird racket, but YT likes the idea of it. Usually the CIC won't pay any attention to a courier. That, again, is with a K uh, because it's hip. But apparently Hero has a deal with them. Maybe she can make a deal with Hero. Because YT knows a lot of interesting little things. One of the things she knows is that the Mafia owes her a favor. Okay, so that's where we were last week uh, when we left off. And now I think we see some more of uh, the street. Uh, that's with a capital S. The street. I try to emphasize that, but it doesn't always come across because it's not easy to, to emphasize that stuff in English anyway. It's not obvious. And then there's the cat who's very obvious. He's very obvious. He wants to snuggle. There we go. Yes. This is how it should be. Now that he's gotten fuzz all over my book. All over it. And that's the way it should be, too. All right. And yes, I am reading from an actual bound uh, mixture of uh, pressed tree pulp and ink. An actual book. I know. Crazy, right? I have an entire wall covered in the things. And I love them. I love them immensely. They're very important to me. Which is part of why I'm doing this. Is It's like, you know what? I have a fear that people aren't, aren't, aren't being exposed to these wonderful things. And hell with it. Let's, let's do that. Let's expose people to it. Maybe you like it. Maybe you don't. That's okay. You're allowed to like what you like and not like what you don't like. Yes. Yes, you're so sound. All right. And without further ado... Chapter 5. As Hero approaches the street, he sees two young couples, probably using their parents' computers for a double date in the metaverse, climbing down out of Port Zero, which is the local port of entry and monorail stop. He is not seeing real people, of course. This is all a part of the moot now, of course. Give me a sec. No way in hell was that legit, and it wasn't. Okay, so let's let's try that again. <sighs> Chapter 5. As Hero approaches the street, 
he sees two young couples, probably using their parents' computers for a double date in the metaverse, climbing down out of Port Zero, which is the local port of entry and monorail stop. He's not seeing real people, of course. This is all a part of the moving illustration drawn by his computer, according to specifications coming down the fiber-optic cable. The people are pieces of software called avatars. They are the audiovisual bodies that people use to communicate with each other in the metaverse. Hero's avatar is now on the street, too, and if the couples coming off the monorail look over in his direction, they can see him, just as he's seeing them. They could strike up a conversation. Hero in the You Store It in L.A., and the four teenagers probably on a couch in a suburb of Chicago, each with their own laptop. But they probably won't talk to each other any more than they would in reality. These are nice kids, and they don't want to talk to a solitary crossbreed with a slick custom avatar who's packing a couple of swords. Your avatar can look any way you want it to, up to the limitations of your equipment. If you're ugly, you can make your avatar beautiful. If you've just gotten out of bed, your avatar can still be wearing beautiful clothes and professionally applied makeup. You can look like a gorilla or a dragon or a giant talking penis in the metaverse. Spend five minutes walking down the street and you will see all of these. Hero's avatar just looks like Hero, with the difference that no matter what Hero is wearing in reality, his avatar always wears a black leather kimono. Most hacker types don't go in for garish avatars because they know that it takes a lot more sophistication to render a realistic human face than a talking penis. Kind of the way people who really know clothing can appreciate the fine details that separate a cheap gray wool suit from an expensive hand-tailored gray wool suit. You can't just materialize anywhere in the metaverse, like Captain Kirk beaming down from on high. This would be confusing and irritating to the people around you. It would break the metaphor. Materializing out of nowhere, or vanishing back into reality, is considered to be a private function, best done in the confines of your own house. Most avatars nowadays are anatomically correct, and naked as a babe when they are first created, so in any case you have to make yourself decent before you emerge onto the street. Unless you're something intrinsically indecent and you don't care. If you are some peon who does not own a house, for example, a person who is coming in from a public terminal, then you materialize in a port. There are 256 express ports on the street, evenly spaced around its circumference, at intervals of 256 kilometers. Each of these intervals is further subdivided 256 times with local ports, spaced exactly one kilometer apart. Astute students of hacker semiotics will note the obsessive repetition of the number 256, which is 2 to the 8th power. And even that 8 looks pretty juicy, dripping with 2 to the seconds additional 2s. The ports serve a function analogous to airports. This is where you drop into the metaverse from somewhere else. Once you have materialized in a port, you can walk down the street or hop on the monorail or whatever. The couples coming off the monorail can't afford to have custom avatars made and don't know how to write their own. They have to buy off-the-shelf avatars. One of the girls has a pretty nice one. It would be considered quite the fashion statement among the k -tel set. Looks like she has bought the avatar construction set, TM, and put together her own, customized model out of miscellaneous parts. It might even look something like its owner. Her date doesn't look half bad himself. The other girl is a Brandy. Her date is a Clint. Brandy and Clint are both popular off-the-shelf models. When white trash high school girls are going on a date in the metaverse, they invariably run down to the computer games section of the local Walmart and buy a copy of Brandy. The user can select three breast sizes, improbable, impossible, and ludicrous. Brandy has a limited repertoire of facial expressions, cute and pouty, cute and sultry, perky and interested, smiling and receptive, cute and spacey. Her eyelashes are half an inch long, and the software is so cheap that they are rendered as solid ebony chips. When a brandy flutters her eyelashes, you can almost feel the breeze. Clint is just the male counterpart of brandy. He is craggy and handsome and has an extremely limited range of facial expressions. 
Hero wonders, idly, how these two couples got together. They are clearly from disparate social classes. Perhaps older and younger siblings. But then they come down the escalator and disappear into the crowd and become part of the street, where there are enough clints and brandies to found a new ethnic group. The street is fairly busy. Most of the people here are Americans and Asians. It's early morning in Europe right now. Because of the preponderance of Americans, the crowd has a garish and surreal look about it. For the Asians, it's the middle of the day, and they are in their dark blue suits. For the Americans, it's party time, and they are looking like just about anything a computer can render. The moment Hero steps across the line separating his neighborhood from the street, colored shapes begin to swoop down on him from all directions, like buzzards on fresh roadkill. Animercials are not allowed in Hero's neighborhood. But almost anything is allowed in the street. A passing fighter plane bursts into flames, falls out of its trajectory, and zooms directly toward him at twice the speed of sound. It plows into the street fifty feet in front of him, disintegrates, and explodes, blooming into a tangled cloud of wreckage and flame that skids across the pavement toward him, growing to envelop him so that all he can see is turbulent flame, perfectly simulated and rendered. Then the display freezes, and a man materializes in front of Hero. He is a classic bearded, pale, skinny hacker, trying to beef himself up by wearing a bulky sink silk windbreaker blazoned with the logo of one of the big metaverse amusement parks. Hero knows the guy. They used to run into each other at trade conventions all the time. He's been trying to hire Hero for the last two months. Hero, I can't understand why you're holding out on me. We're making bucks here. Kong bucks and yen. And we can be flexible on pay and bennies. We're putting together a swords and sorcery thing, and we can use a hacker with your skills. Come on down and talk to me, okay? Hero walks straight through the display, and it vanishes. Amusement parks in the metaverse can be fantastic, offering a wide selection of interactive three-dimensional movies. But in the end, there's still nothing more than video games. Hero's not so poor, yet, that he would go and write video games for this company. It's owned by the Nipponese, which is no big deal, but it's also managed by the Nipponese, which means that all the programmers have to wear white shirts and show up at 8 in the morning and sit in cubicles and go to meetings. When Hero learned how to do this, way back 15 years ago, a hacker could sit down and write an entire piece of software by himself. Now that's no longer possible. Software comes out of the factories, and hackers are, to a greater or lesser extent, assembly line workers. Worse yet, they may, become, they may become managers, who never get to write any code themselves. The prospect of becoming an assembly line worker gives Hero some incentive to go out and find some really good intel tonight. He tries to get himself psyched up, tries to break out of the lethargy of the long-term underemployed. This intel thing can be a great racket once you get yourself jacked into the grid. And with his connections, it shouldn't be any problem. He just has to get serious about it. Get serious. Get serious. But it's so hard to get serious about anything. He owes the Mafia the cost of a new car. That's a good reason to get serious. He cuts straight across the street and under the monorail line, headed for a large, low-slung black building. It is extraordinarily somber for the street, like a parcel that someone forgot to develop. It's a squat black pyramid with the top cut off. It has one single door. Since this is all imaginary, there are no regulations dictating the number of emergency exits. There are no guards, no signs, nothing to bar people from going in. Yet thousands of avatars mill around, peering inside, looking for a glimpse of something. These people can't pass through the door because they haven't been invited. Above the door is a matte black hemisphere about a meter in diameter, set into the front wall of the building. It is the closest thing the place has to decoration. Underneath it, in letters carved into the wall's black substance, is the name of the place. 
The Black Sun. So it's not an architectural masterpiece. When DA5 id, which I think I'll refer to as David from now on, da 5 id, <laughs> da 5 id and Hero and the other hackers wrote the Black Sun, they didn't have enough money to hire architects or designers, they, so they just went in for simple geometric shapes. The avatars milling around the entrance don't seem to care. If these avatars were real people in a real street, Hero wouldn't be able to reach the entrance. It's way too crowded. But the computer system that operates the street has better things to do than to monor monitor every single one of the millions of people there, trying to prevent them from running into each other. It doesn't bother trying to solve this incredibly difficult problem. On the street, avatars just walk right through each other. So, when Hero cuts through the crowd, headed for the entrance, he really is cutting through the crowd. When things get this jammed together, the computer simplifies things by drawing all of the avatars ghostly and translucent, so you can see where you're going. Hero appears solid to himself, but everyone else looks like a ghost. He walks through the crowd as if it's a fog bank, clearly seeing the black sun in front of him. He steps over the property line, and he's in the doorway. And in that instant, he becomes solid and visible to all the av avatars milling outside. As one, they all begin screaming. Not that they have any idea who the hell he is. Hero is just a starving CIC stringer who lives in a U-Storet by the airport. But in the entire world, there are only a couple of thousand people who can step over the line into the Black Sun. He turns and looks back at 10,000 shrieking groupies. Now that he's all by himself in the entryway, no longer immersed in a flood of avatars, he can see all of the people in the front row of the crowd with perfect clarity. They are all done up in their wildest and fanciest avatars, hoping that Defyvid, the Black Sun's owner and hacker-in-chief, will invite them inside. They flicker and merge together into a hysterical wall. Stunningly beautiful women, computer airbrushed and retouched at 72 frames a second, like Playboy pinups turned three-dimensional, these are would-be actresses hoping to be discovered. Wild-looking abstracts, tornadoes of gyrating light, hackers who are hoping that Defyvid will notice their talent, invite them inside, and give them a job. A liberal sprinkling of black and white people, persons who are accessing the metaverse through cheap public terminals, and who are rendered in jerky, grainy black and white. A lot of these are run-of-the-mill psycho fans, devoted to the fantasy of stabbing some particular actri actress to death. They can't even get close in reality, so they goggle into the metaverse to stalk their prey. There are would-be rock stars done up in laser light, as though they just stepped off the concert stage, and the avatars of Nipponese businessmen exquisitely rendered by their fancy equipment, but utterly reserved and boring in their suits. There's one black and white who stands out because he's taller than the rest. The street protocol states that your avatar can't be any taller than you are. This is to prevent people from walking around a mile high. Besides, if this guy's using a pay terminal, which he must be to judge from the image quality, it can't jazz up his avatar. It just shows him the way he is, except not as well. Talking to a black and white on the street is like talking to a person who has his face stuck in a Xerox machine, repeatedly pounding the copy button, while you stand by the output tray, pulling the sheets out one at a time and looking at them. He has long hair, parted in the middle like a curtain to reveal a tattoo on his forehead. Given the shitty resolution, there's no way to see the tattoo clearly, but it appears to consist of words. He has a wispy Fu Manchu mustache. Hero realizes that the guy has noticed him, and is staring back, looking him up and down, paying particular attention to the swords. A grin spreads across the black and white guy's face. It is a satisfied grin, a grin of recognition, the grin of a man who knows something Hero doesn't. The black and white guy has been standing with his arms folded across his chest, like a man who is bored, who's been waiting for something, and now his arms drop to his sides, swing loosely at the shoulders, like an athlete limbering up. He steps as close as he can and leans forward, 
He's so tall that the only thing behind him is empty black sky, torn with the glowing vapor trails of passing animercials. Hey, hero, the black and white guy says. You want to try some snow crash? A lot of people hang around in front of the Black Sun, saying weird things. You ignore them. But this gets Hero's attention. Oddity the First. The guy knows Hero's name. But people have ways of getting that information. It's probably nothing. The Second. This sounds like an offer from a drug pusher. Which would be normal in front of a reality bar. But this is the Metaverse. And you can't sell drugs in the metaverse because you can't get high by looking at some by looking at something. The third. The name of the drug. Heroes never heard of a drug called Snow Crash before. That's not unusual. A thousand new drugs get invented each year, and each of them sells under half a dozen brand names. But Snow Crash is computer lingo. It means a system crash, a bug at such a fundamental level that it frags the part of the computer that controls the electron beam in the monitor, making it spray wildly across the screen, turning the perfect grid work of pixels into a gyrating blizzard. Hero has seen it happen a million times, but it's a very peculiar name for a drug. The thing that really gets Hero's attention is his confidence. He has an utterly calm, stolid presence. It's like talking to an asteroid which would be okay if you were doing something that made the tiniest bit of sense. Hero's trying to read some clues in the guy's face, but the closer he looks, the more his shitty black-and-white avatar seems to break up into jittering, hard-edged pixels. It's like putting his nose against the glass of a busted TV. It makes his teeth hurt. Excuse me, Hero says. What did you say? You want to try some snow crash? You want to try some snow crash? He has a crisp accent that Hero can't quite place. His audio is as bad as his video. Hero can hear cars going past the guy in the background. He must be goggled in from a public terminal alongside some freeway. I don't get it, Hero says. What is snow crash? It's a drug, asshole, the guy says. What do you think? Wait a minute. This is a new one on me. Hero says. You honestly think I'm going to give you some money here? And then what do I do? Wait for you to mail me the stuff? I said try, not buy, the guy says. You don't have to give me any money. Free sample. And you don't have to wait for no mail. You can have it now. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a hypercard. It looks like a business card. The hypercard is an avatar of sorts. It is used in the metaverse to represent a chunk of data. It might be text, audio, video, a still image, or any other information that can be represented digitally. Think of a baseball card, which carries a picture, some text, and some numerical data. A baseball hypercard could contain a highlight film of the player in action, shown in perfect high-def television, a complete biography read by the player himself in stereo digital sound and a complete statistical database along with specialized software to help you look up the numbers you want. A hypercard can carry a virtually infinite amount of information. For all Hero knows, this hypercard might contain all the books in the Library of Congress, or every episode of Hawaii Five-O that was ever filmed, or the complete recordings of Jimi Hendrix, or the 1950 census. Or, more likely, a wide variety of nasty computer viruses. If Hero reaches out and takes the hypercard, then the data it represents will be transferred from this guy's system into Hero's computer. Hero, naturally, wouldn't touch it under any circumstances, any more than you would take a free syringe from a stranger in Times Square and jab it into your neck. And it doesn't make sense anyway. That's a hypercard. I thought you said Snow Crash was a drug, Hero says, now totally nonplussed. It is, the guy says. Try it. Does it fuck up your brain, Hero says, or your computer? Both. Neither. What's the difference? 
Hiro finally realizes that he has just wasted 60 seconds of his life having a meaningless conversation with a paranoid schizophrenic. He turns around and goes into the black sun. Chapter 6 At the exit of White Columns sits a black car, curled up like a panther, a burnished steel lens reflecting the low glow of Oahu Road. It is a unit. It is a mobile unit of the Metacops Unlimited. A silvery badge is embossed on its door, a chrome-plated cop badge the size of a dinner plate, bearing the name of said private peace organization and emblazoned, Dial 1-800-THE-COPS. All major credit cards. Metacops Unlimited is the official peacekeeping force of White Columns, and also of the Mews at Windsor Heights, the Heights at Bear Run, Cinnamon Grove, and the Farms of Cloverdale. They also enforce traffic regulations on all highways and byways operated by Fairlanes Incorporated. A few different Fockneys also use them. Caymans Plus and the Alps, for instance. But franchise nations prefer to have their own security force. You can bet that Metazania and New South Africa handle their own security. That's the only reason people become citizens, so they can get drafted. Obviously, Nova Sicilia has its own security, too. Narcolumbia n doesn't need security because people are scared just to drive past the franchise at less than 100 miles an hour. YT always snags a nifty power boost in neighborhoods thick with Narcolumbia consulates. And Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong, the granddaddy of all Fockneys, handles it in a typically Hong Kong way, with robots. Metacop's main competitor, World Beat Security, handles all roads belonging to cruiseways, plus has a worldwide contracts with uh, Dixie Traditionals, Pickett's Plantation, Rainbow Heights, check it out, two apartheid ber verb claves and one for black suits. Meadowvale on the insert name of river and Bl Brickyard Station. World Beat is smaller than Metacops, handles more upscale contracts, supposedly has a bigger espionage arm, though if that's what people want, they just talk to an account rep at the Central Intelligence Corporation. And then there's the Enforcers, but they cost a lot and don't take well to supervision. It is rumored that, under their uniforms, they wear t-shirts bearing the unofficial enforcer coat of arms, a fist holding a nightstick, emblazoned with the words, Sue Me. So, YT is coasting down a gradual slope toward the heavy iron gate of white columns, waiting for it to roll aside, waiting, waiting, but the gate does not seem to be opening. So no laser pulse has shot out of the guard shack to find out who YT is. The system has been overridden. If YT was a stupid ped, she would go up to the Metacop and ask him why. The Metacop would say, The security of the city-state! And nothing more. These burbclaves. These city-states. So small, so insecure, that just about everything, like not mowing your lawn or playing your stereo too loud, becomes a national security issue. No way to skate around the fence. White Columns has eight-foot iron robo-rot all the way around. She rolls up to the gate, grabs the bars, rattles it, but it's too big and solid to rattle. Metacops aren't allowed to lean against their unit. Makes them look lazy and weak. You can, they can almost lean, look like they're leaning. They can even brandish a big leaning against the car too, like this particular individual, but they can't lean. 
Besides, with the complete glinting majesty of their personal portable equipment suite hanging on their personal modular equipment harness, they would scratch the finish of the unit. Jack this barrier to commence. To commerce, man, I got deliveries to make. YT announces to the Metacop. A wet, smacking burst, not loud enough to be an explosion, sounds from the back of the mobile unit. It is the soft thump of a thick wrestler's loogie being propelled through a rolled-up tongue. It is the distant, muffled splurt of a baby having a big one. YT's hand, still gripping the bars of the gate, stings for a moment, then feels cold and hot at the same time. She can barely move it. She smells vinyl. The Metacop's partner climbs out of the back seat of the mobile unit. The window of the back door is open, but everything on the mobile unit is so black and shiny you can't tell that until the door moves. Both Metacops, under their glossy black helmets and night vision goggles, are grinning. The one getting out of the mobile unit is carrying a short-range chemical restraint projector, a loogie gun. Their little plan has worked. YT didn't think to aim her night visions into the back seat to check for a goo-firing sniper. The loogie, when expanded into the air like this, is about the size of a football. Miles and miles of eensy but strong fibers, like spaghetti. The sauce on the spaghetti is sticky, goopy stuff that stays fluid for an instant when the loogie gun is fired, then sets quickly. Metacops have to tote this kind of gear because when each franchulet is so small, you can't be chasing people around. The perp, almost always an innocent thrasher, is always a three-second skateboard ride away from asylum in the neighboring franchulet. Also, the incredible bulk of the personal modular equipment harness, the chandelier o gear, and all that is clipped onto and all that is clipped onto it, slows them down so bad that whenever they try to run, people just start laughing at them. So, instead of losing some pounds, they just clip more stuff onto their harnesses, like the loogie gun. The snotty, fibrous drop of stuff has wrapped all the way around her hand and forearm, and has lashed them down onto the bar of the gate. Excess goo has sagged and run down the bar a short ways, but is setting now, turning into rubber. A few loose strands have also whipped forward and gained footholds on her shoulder, chest, and lower face. She backs away and the adhesive separates from the fibers, stretching out into long, infinitely thin strands, like hot mozzarella. These set instantly, become solid, and then break, curling away like smoke. It is not quite so grotendous now that the loogie is off her face, but her hand is still perfectly immobilized. You are hereby warned that any movement on your part not explicitly endorsed by verbal authorization on my part may pose a direct risk, physical risk to you, as well as consequential, psychological, and possibly, depending on your personal belief system, spiritual risks ensuing from your personal reaction to said physical risk. Any movement on your part constitutes an implicit and irrevocable acceptance of such risk, the first Metacop says. There is a little speaker on his belt, simultaneously translating all this into Spanish and Japanese. Or as you, uh, or as we used to say, the other metacop says, "Freeze, sucker." The untranslatable word resonates from the little speaker, pronounced "esaka" and "saka" respectively. We are authorized deputies of Metacops Unlimited. Under Section 24.5.2 of the White Columns Code, we are authorized to carry out the actions of a police force on this territory. Such as hassling innocent thrashes, YT says. The Metacop turns off the translator. By speaking English, you implicitly and irrevocably agree for all our future conversations to take place in the English language, he says. You can't even res what YT says, YT says. You have been identified as an investigatory focus of a registered criminal event that is alleged to have taken place on another territory, namely the Muse at Windsor Heights. That's another country, man. This is White Columns. 
Under provisions of the Mews at Windsor Heights Code, we are authorized to enforce law, national security concerns, and social harmony on said territory also. A treaty between the Mews at Windsor Heights and White Columns authorizes us to place you in temporary custody until your status as an investigatory focus has been resolved. Your ass is busted, the second Metacop says. As your v demeanor has been non-aggressive and you carry no visible weapons, we are not authorized to employ heroic measures to ensure your cooperation, the first Metacop says. You stay cool and we'll stay cool, the second Metacop says. However, we are equipped with we <laughs> However, we are equipped with devices, including but not limited to projectile weapons, which, if used, may pose an extreme and immediate threat to your health and well being. Make one funny move and we'll blow your head off, the second metacop says. Just unglaw my fucking hand, YT says. She has heard all this a million times before. White Columns, like most Burbclaves, has no jail, no police station. So unsightly. Property values. Think of the liability exposure. Metacops has a franchise just down the road that serves as a headquarters. As for a jail, some place to habeas the occasional stray corpus, any half-decent franchise strip has one. They are cruising on the mobile unit. Cruising in the mobile unit. YT's hands are cuffed together in front of her. One hand is still half encased in rubbery goo, smelling so intensely of vinyl fumes that both metacops have rolled down their windows. Six feet of loose fibers trail into her lap, across the floor of the unit, out the door, and drag on the pavement. The metacops are taking it easy, cruising down the middle lane, not above issuing a speeding ticket here and there as long as they're in their jurisdiction. Motorists around them drive slowly and sanely, appalled by the thought of having to pull over and listen to half an hour of disclaimers, advisements, and tangled justifications from the likes of these. The occasional Cosa Nostra delivery boy whips past them into the left lane, orange lights aflame, and they pretend not to notice. What's it gonna be, the Hooskow or the Clink? the first metacop says. From the way he is talking, he must be talking to the other metacop. The Hooskow, please, YT says. The Clink, the other metacop says, turning around, sneering at her through the anti-ballistic glass, wallowing in power. The whole interior of the car lights up as they drive past a buy-and-fly. Loiter in the parking lot of a buy-and-fly, and you'd get a suntan. Then, World Beat Security would come and arrest you. All that security-inducing light makes the Visa and MasterCard stickers on the driver's side window glow for a moment. YT is card-carrying, YT says. What does it cost to get off? How come you keep calling yourself Whitey? The second Metacop says. Oh. I've been saying his voice wrong the whole time, I'm sorry. Like many of people of color, he has misconstrued her name. Not Whitey, YT. Oh, shit, I did it again. Not Whitey, YT, the first metacop says. That's what YT is called, YT says. That's what I said, the second metacop says. Whitey. YT. What? Uh... This is hard. <laughs> Y.T., the first one says, accenting the T so brutally that he throws a glittering burst of saliva against the windshield. Let me guess. Yolanda Truman? No. Yvonne Thomas? No. What's it stand for? Nothing. Actually, it stands for yours truly, but if they can't figure that out, fuck them. You can't afford it, the first metacop says. You're going up against TMAWH here. 
I don't have to officially get off. I could just escape. This is a class unit. We don't support escapes, the first Metacop says. Tell you what, the second one says. You pay us a trillion bucks and we'll take you to a Huskow. Then you can bargain with them. Half a trillion, YT says. Seven hundred and fifty billion, the f Metacop says. Final. Shit, you're wearing cuffs. You can't be bargaining with us. YT unzips a pocket on the thigh of her coverall, pulls out the card with her clean hand, runs it through a slot on the back of the front seat, puts it back in her pocket. The Hooskow looks like a nice new one. YT has seen hotels that were worse places to sleep. Its logo sign, a saguaro cactus with a black cowboy hat resting on top of it at a jaunty angle, is brand new and clean. The Hooskow! Premium incarceration and restraint services. We welcome busloads. There are a couple of other Metacop cars in the lot, and an Enforcer Paddy bus parked across the back, taking up ten consecutive spaces. This draws much attention from the Metacops. The Enforcers are to the Metacops what the Delta Force is to the Peace Corps. One to check in, says the second Metacop. They are standing in the reception area. The walls are lined with illuminated signs, each one bearing the image of some Old West desperado. Annie Oakley stares down blankly at YT, providing a role model. The check-in counter is faux rustic. The employees all wear cowboy hats and five-pointed stars with their names embossed on them. The back is a door made of hokey, old-fashioned iron bars. Once you got through there, it would look like an operating room. The whole, a whole line of little cells, curvy and white like prefab shower stalls. In fact, they double as shower stalls. You bathe in the middle of the room. Bright lights that turn themselves off at 11 o'clock. Coin-operated TV. Private phone line. YT can hardly wait. The cowboy behind the desk aims a scanner at YT, zaps her barcode. Hundreds of pages about YT's personal life zoom up on a graphic screen. Huh, he says. Female. The two Metacops look at each other like, What a genius. This guy could never be a Metacop. Sorry, boys, we're full up. No space for females tonight. Ah, oh, come on. See that bussin' back? There was a riot at Snooze and Cruise. Some Narcolumbians were selling a bad batch of vertigo. Place went nuts. Enforcers sent in a half dozen squads, brought in about thirty. So we're full up. Try the clink down the street. Y.T. does not like the looks of this. They put her back in the car, turn on the noise cancellation in the back seat so she can't hear anything except squirts and gurgles coming from her own empty tummy, and the glistening crackle whenever she moves her glommed-up hand. She was really looking forward to a Huskow meal, campfire chili, or bandit burgers. In the front seat, the two metacops are talking to each other. They pull out into traffic. Up in front of them is a square illuminated logo, a giant universal product code in black on white with buy and fly underneath it. Stuck in onto the same signpost, beneath the buy and fly sign, is a smaller one, a narrow strip in generic lettering. The Clink. They are taking her to the Clink. The bastards. She pounds on the glass with cuffed up cuffed together hands, leaving sticky handprints. Let these bastards try to wash the stuff off. They turn around and look right through her, the guilty scum, like they heard something, but they can't imagine what. They enter the buy and flies nimbus of radioactive blue security light. Second Metacop goes in, talks to the guy behind the counter. There's a fat white boy purchasing a Monster Trucks magazine, wearing a new South Africa baseball cap with a Confederate flag, and overhearing them, he peers out the window, wanting to lay his eyes on a real perp. A second man comes out from back, same ethnicity as the guy behind the counter, another dark man with burning eyes and bony neck. This one is carrying a three-ring binder with the Buy and Fly logo. To find the manager of a franchise, don't strain to read his title off the name tag. Just look for the one with the binder. The manager talks to the Metacop, nods his head, pulls a keychain out of the drawer. 
Second Metacop comes out, saunters to the car, suddenly whips open the back door. Shut up, he says. Or next time I fire the loogie gun into your mouth. Good thing you like the clink, YT says, because that is where you will be tomorrow night, loogie man. What, what? Is that right? Yeah, for credit card fraud. Me cop, you thrasher. How are you going to make a case at Judge Bob's judicial system? I work for Radix. We protect our own. Not tonight you don't. Tonight you took a pizza from the scene of a car wreck, left the scene of an accident. Radix tell you to deliver that pizza? YT does not return fire. The Metacop is right. Radix did not tell her to deliver that pizza. She was doing it on a whim. So Radix ain't gonna help you, so shut up. He jerks her arm, and the rest of her follows. The three-ringer gives her a quick look, just long enough to make sure she is really a person, not a sack of flour or an engine block or a tree stump. He leads them around to the fetid rump of the by-and-fly, dark realm of wretched refuse in teeming dumpsters. He unlocks the back door, a boring steel number with jimmy marks around the edges like steel-clawed beasts have been trying to get in. YT is taken downstairs into the basement. First Metacop follows, carrying her plank, banging it heedlessly against doorways and stained polycarbonate bottle racks. Better take a uniform, all that gear, the second Metacop suggests, not unlewdly. The manager looks at YT, trying not to let his gaze travel sinfully up and down her body. For thousands of years, his people have survived on alertness, waiting for Mongols to come galloping over the horizon, waiting for repeat offenders to swing sawed-off shotguns across their checkout counters. His alertness right now is palpable and painful. He's like a goblet of hot nitroglycerin. The added question of sexual misconduct makes it even worse. To him, it's no joke. Y.T. shrugs, trying to think of something unnerving and wacky. At this point, she is supposed to squeal and shrink, wriggle and whine, swoon and beg. They are threatening to take her clothes. How awful. But she does not get upset because she knows that they are expecting her to. A courier has to establish space on the pavement. Predictable, law-abiding behavior lulls driving drivers. They mentally assign you to a little box in the lane, assume you will stay there, can't handle it when you leave that little box. Y.T. is not fond of boxes. Y.T. establishes her space on the pavement by zagging mightily from lane to lane, establishing a precedent of scary randomness, keeps people on their toes, makes them react to her, instead of the other way around. Now these men are trying to put her in a box, make her follow rules. She unzips her coverall all the way down below her navel. Underneath is naught but billowing pale flesh. The metacops raise their eyebrows. The manager jumps back, raises both hands up to form a visual shield, protecting himself from the damaging input. No, 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 he says. Y.T. shrugs, zips herself back up. She's not afraid. She's wearing a dentata. The manager handcuffs her to a cold water pipe. Second Metacop removes his newer, more cybernetic brand of handcuffs, snaps them back onto his harness. First Metacop leans her plank against the wall, just out of her reach. Manager kicks a rusty coffee can across the floor, caroming it expertly off her skin, so she can go to the bathroom. Where you from? Y.T. asks. Tajikistan, he says. A jeek. She should have known. Well, shit can soccer must have been your, must be your national pastime. The manager doesn't get it. The metacops emit rote, shallow laughter. Papers are signed. Everyone else goes upstairs. On his way out the door, the manager turns off the lights. In Tajikistan, electricity is quite the big deal. Y.T. is in the clink.
And I'll be right back in just a sec, folks. All right, and I am back. <coughs> so YT is in the clink. How will she ever escape this heinous, heinous situation? Well, we will not be finding out immediately. We'll be finding out in a little bit. So now we're transitioning back to Hero. Chapter 7. The black sun is as big as a couple of football fields laid side by side. The decor consists of black square tabletops hovering in the air. It would be pointless to draw in legs, evenly spaced across the floor in a grid, like pixels. The only exception is in the middle, where the bar's four quadrants come together. Four equals two squared. This part is occupied by a circular bar 16 meters across. Everything is matte black, which makes it a lot easier for the computer system to draw things on top of it. No worries about filling in a complicated background. And that way, all attention can be focused on the avatars, which is the way people like it. It doesn't pay to have a nice avatar on the street, where it's so crowded and all the avatars merge and flow into one another. But the Black Sun is a much classier piece of software. In the Black Sun, avatars are not allowed to collide. Only so many people can be here at once, 
and they can't walk through each other. Everything is solid and opaque and realistic. And the clientele has a lot more class. No talking penises in here. The avatars look like real people. For the most part, so do the daemons. Daemon is an old piece of jargon from the Unix operating system, where it referred to a piece of low-level utility software, a fundamental part of the operating system. In the Black Sun, a daemon is like an avatar, but it does not represent a human being. It's a robot that lives in the metaverse, a piece of software, a kind of spirit that inhabits the machine, usually with some particular role to carry out. The Black Sun has a number of daemons that serve imaginary drinks to the patrons and run little errands for people. It even has bouncer daemons that get rid of un undesirables, grab their avatars and throw them out the door, applying certain basic f principles of avatar physics. Defyvid ha e has even enhanced the physics of the Black Sun to make, peep to make it a little cartoonish, so that particularly obnoxious people can be hit over the head with a giant with giant mallets or crushed under plummeting safes before they are ejected. This happens to people who are being disruptive, to anyone who is pestering or taping a celebrity, and to anyone who seems contagious. That is, if your personal computer is infected with viruses and attempts to spread them via the black sun, you had better keep one eye on the ceiling. Hero mumbles the word big board. This is the name of a piece of software he wrote, a power tool for CIC Stringer. For a CIC Stringer. It digs into the Black Sun's operating system, rifles it for information, and then throws up a flat square map in front of his face, giving him a quick overview of who's here and whom they're talking to. It's all unauthorized data that Hero is not supposed to have. But Hero is not some bimbo actor coming here to network. He is a hacker. If he wants some information, he steals it right out of the guts of the system. Gossip ex machina. Big Board shows him that Defyvid is ensconced in his usual place, a table in the hacker quadrant near the bar. The movie star quadrant has the usual scatterings of sovereigns and wannabes. The rock star quadrant is very busy tonight. Hiro can see that a Nipponese rap star named Sushi K has stopped in for a visit. And there are a lot of record industry types hanging around in the Nipponese quadrant, which looks like the other quadrants except that it's quieter, the tables are closer to the floor, and it's full of bowing and fluttering geisha demons. Demons. Many of these people probably belong to Sushi K's retinue of managers, flax, and lawyers. Hero cuts across the hacker quadrant, headed for Defyvid's table. He recognizes many of the people in here, but, as usual, he's surprised and disturbed by the number he doesn't recognize. All those sharp, perceptive 21-year-old faces. Software development, like professional sports, has a way of making 30-year-old men feel decrepit. Looking up the aisle toward Defyvid's table, he sees Defyvid talking to a black-and-white person. Despite her lack of color and shitty resolution, Hero recognize her, recognizes her by the way she folds her arms when she's talking, the way she tosses her hair when she's listening to Defyvid. Hero's avatar stops moving and stares at her, adopting just the same facial expression with which he used to stare at this woman years ago. In reality, he reaches out with one hand, picks up his beer, takes a pull on the bottle, and lets it roll around in his mouth, a bundle of waves clashing inside a small space. All right, you, you're being a pest. You're being quite a pest. A monster. Oh shit, have I been muted this whole time? I think I might have. Oh well. Her name is Juanita Marquez. Hero has known her ever since they were freshmen together at Berkeley, and they were in the same lab section in a freshman physics class. The first time he saw her, he formed an impression that did not change for many years. She was a dour, bookish, geeky type who dressed like she was interviewing for a job as an accountant or at a funeral parlor. 
At the same time, she had a flamethrower tongue that she would turn on people at the oddest times, usually in some grandiose, earth-scorching retaliation for a slight or breach of etiquette that none of the other freshmen had even perceived. It wasn't until a number of years later, when they both wound up working at Black Sun Systems Incorporated, that he put the other half of the equation together. At the time, both of them were working on avatars. He was working on bodies, she was working on faces. She was the face department, because nobody thought that faces were all that important. They were just flesh-toned busts on top of the avatars. She was just in the process of proving them all desperately wrong. But at this phase, the all-male society of bitheads that made up the power structure of Black Sun Systems said that the face problem was trivial and superficial. It was, of course, nothing more than sexism, the especially virulent type espoused by male techies who sincerely believe that they are too smart to be sexists. That first impression, back at the age of 17, was nothing more than that, the gut reaction of a post-adolescent army brat who had been on his own for about three weeks. His mind was good, but he only understood one or two things in the whole world. Samurai movies and the Macintosh. And he understood them far, far too well. It was a worldview with no room for someone like Juanita. There is a certain kind of small town that grows like a boil on the ass of every army base in the world. In a long series of such places, Hero Protagonist was speed-raised like a mutant hothouse orchid flourishing under the glow of a thousand buy-and-fly security spotlights. Hero's father had joined the army in 1944, at the age of 16, and spent a year in the Pacific, most of it as a prisoner of war. Hero was born when his father was in his late middle age. By that time, Dad could long since have quit and taken his pension, but he wouldn't have known what to do with himself outside of the service, and so he stayed in, until finally they kicked him out in the late 80s. By the time Hero made it out to Berkeley, he had lived in Wrightstown, New Jersey, Tacoma, Washington, Fayetteville, North Carolina, Hinesville, Georgia, Killeen, Texas, Grafenware, Germany, Seoul, South Korea, Ogden, Kansas, and Watertown, New York. All of these places were basically the same, with the same franchise ghettos, the same strip joints, and even the same people. He kept running into school chums he'd known years before, other army brats who happened to wind up at the same base at the same time. Their skins were different colors, but they all belonged to the same ethnic group, military. Black kids didn't talk like black kids. Asian kids didn't bust their asses to excel in school. White kids, by and large, didn't have any problems getting along with the black and Asian kids. And girls knew their place. They all had the same moms with the same generous buttocks and stretchy slacks and the same frosted and curling ironed hairdos, and they were all basically sweet and endearing and conforming, and, if they happened to be smart, they went out of their way to hide it. So, the first time Hiro saw Juanita, or any other girl like her, his perspectives were all bent out of shape. She had long, glossy black hair that had never been subjected to any chemical process other than regular shampooing. She didn't wear blue stuff on her eyelids. Her clothing was dark, tailored, restrained. And she didn't take shit from anyone, not even her professors, which seemed shrewish and threatening to him at the time. When he saw her again after an absence of several years, a period spent mostly in Japan working among real grown-ups from a higher social class that he was used to, people of substance who wore real clothes and did real things with their lives, he was startled to realize that Juanita was an elegant, stylish knockout. He thought at first that she had undergone some kind of radical change since their first year in college. But then he went back to visit his father in one of those army towns and ran into the high school prom queen. She had grown up shockingly fast into an overweight dame with loud hair and loud clothes who speed-read the tabloids and at the checkout line in the commissary because she didn't have the spare money to buy them, who popped her gum and had two kids that she didn't have the energy or foresight to discipline. Seeing this woman at the commissary, he finally went through a belated, dim-witted epiphany, not a brilliant light shining down from heaven, more like the brown glimmer of a half-dead flashlight from the top of a stepladder. 
Juanita hadn't really changed much at all since those days, just grown into herself. It was he who had changed. Radically. He came into her office once, strictly on a business matter. Until this point, they had seen each other around the office a lot, but acted like they had never met before. But when he came into her office that day, she told him to close the door behind him, and she blacked out the screen on her computer and started twiddling a pencil between her hands and eyed him like a plate of day-old sushi. Behind her on the wall was an amateurish painting of an old lady, set in an ornate antique frame. It was the only decoration in Juanita's office. All the other hackers had color photographs of the space shuttle lifting off, or posters of the Starship Enterprise. "'It's my late grandmother, may God have mercy on her soul,' she said, watching him look at the painting. "'My role model.' "'Why? Was she a programmer?' She just looked at him over the rotating pencil, like, how slow can a mammal be and still have respiratory functions? But instead of lowering the boom on him, she just gave him a simple answer. No. Then she gave a more complicated answer. When I was fifteen years old, I missed a period. My boyfriend and I were using a diaphragm, but I knew it was fallible. I was good at math, I had the failure rate memorized, burnt into my subconscious. Or maybe it was my conscious. I can never keep them straight. Anyway, I was terrified. Our family dog started treating me differently. Supposedly, they can smell a pregnant woman. Or a pregnant bitch, for that matter. By this point, Hero's face was frozen in a wary, astonished position that Juanita later made extensive use of in her work. Because, as she was talking to him, she was watching his face, analyzing the way the little muscles in his forehead pulled up pulled his brows up, and made his eyes change shape. My mother was clueless. My boyfriend was worse than clueless. In fact, I ditched him on the spot, because it made me realize what an alien the guy was, like many members of your species. By this, she was referring to males. Anyway, my grandmother came to visit, she continued, glancing back over her shoulder at the painting. I avoided her until we all sat down for dinner. And then she figured out the whole situation in maybe ten minutes, just by watching my face across the dinner table. I didn't say more than ten words. Pass the tortillas. I didn't know how my face conveyed that information, or what kind of internal wiring my grandmother's mind enabled her, in my grandmother's mind, enabled her to accomplish this incredible feat, to condense fact from the vapor of nuance. Condense fact from the vapor of nuance. Hero has never forgotten the sound of her speaking those words, the feeling that came over him as he realized for the first time how smart Juanita was. She continued, I didn't even really appreciate all of this until about ten years later, as a grad student trying to build a user interface that would convey a lot of data very quickly for one of those these baby-killer grants. That was her term for anything related to the Defense Department. I was coming up with all kinds of elaborate technical fixes, like trying to implement her electrodes directly into the brain. Then I remembered my grandmother and realized, my God, the human mind can absorb and process an incredible amount of information, if it comes in the right format, the right interface, if you put the right face on it. Want some coffee? Then he had an alarming thought. What had he been like back in college? How much of an asshole had he been? Had he left Juanita with a bad impression? Another young man would have worried about it in silence, but Hero has never been restrained by thinking about things too hard, and so he asked her out for dinner, and, after having a couple of drinks, she drank club sodas, just popped the question, Do you think I'm an asshole? She laughed. He smiled, believing that he had come up with a good, endearing, flirtatious bit of patter. He did not realize, until a couple of years later, that this question was, in effect, the cornerstone of their relationship. Did Juanita think that Hero was an asshole? He always had some reason to think that the answer was yes, but nine times out of ten she insisted that the answer was no. It made for some great arguments and some great sex, some dramatic fallings out and some passionate reconciliations, but in the end, the wildness was just too much for them. They were exhausted by work, and they backed away from each other. 
He was emotionally worn out from wondering what she really thought of him, and confused by the fact that he cared so deeply about her opinion. And she, maybe, was beginning to think that if Hero was so convinced in his own mind that he was unworthy of her, maybe he knew something that she didn't. Hero would have chalked it all up to class differences, except that her parents lived in a house in Mexicali with a dirt floor, and his father made more money than many college professors. But the class idea still held sway in his mind, because class is more than income. It has to do with knowing where you stand in a web of social relationships. Juanita and her folks knew where they stood with a certitude that bordered on dementia. Hero never knew. His father was a sergeant major, his mother was a Korean woman whose people had been mine slaves in Nippon, and Hiro didn't know whether he was black or Asian or just plain army, whether he was rich or poor, educated or ignorant, talented or lucky. He didn't even have a part of the country to call home until he moved to California, which is about as specific as saying that you live in the Northern Hemisphere. In the end, it was probably his general disorientation that did them in. After the breakup, Hero went out with a long succession of essentially bimbos who, unlike Juanita, were impressed that he worked for a high-tech Silicon Valley firm. More recently, he has had to go searching for women who are even easier to impress. Juanita went celibate for a while and then started going out with Defivid and eventually got married to him. Defivid had no doubts whatsoever about his standing in the world. His folks were Russian Jews from Brooklyn, and had lived in the same brownstone for 70 years after coming from a village in Latvia, where they had lived for 500 years. With a Torah on his lap, he could trace his bloodline all the way back to Adam and Eve. He was an only child who had always been first in his class in everything, and when he got his master's in computer science from Stanford, he went out and started his own company with about as much fuss as Hero's dad used to exhibit in renting out a new P.O. box when they moved. Then he got rich, and now he runs the Black Sun. Defivit has always been certain of everything. Even when he's totally wrong. Which is why Hero quit his job at Black Sun Systems, despite the promise of future riches, and why Juanita divorced Defivid two years after she married him. Hero did not attend Juanita and Defivid's wedding. He was languishing in jail, into which he had been thrown a few hours before the rehearsal. He had been found in Golden Gate Park, lovesick, wearing nothing but a thong, taking long pulls from a jumbo bottle of Cavossier and practicing kendo attacks with a genuine samurai sword, floating across the grass on powerfully muscled thighs to slice other picnickers hurtling frisbees and baseballs in twain. Catching a long fly ball with the edge of your blade, neatly halving it like a grapefruit, is not an insignificant feat. The only drawback is that the owners of the baseball may misinterpret your intentions and summon the police. He got out of it by paying for all the baseballs and frisbees, but since that episode, he has never even bothered to ask Juanita whether or not she thinks he's an asshole. Even Hero knows that answer now. Since then, they've gone very different ways. In the early years of the Black Sun project, the only way the hackers ever got paid was by issuing stock to themselves. Hero tended to sell his off almost as quickly as he got it. Juanita didn't. Now she's rich, and he isn't. It would be easy to say that Hero is a stupid investor and Juanita a smart one, but the facts are a little more complicated than that. Juanita put her eggs in one basket, keeping all her money in the Black Sun stock. As it turns out, she made a lot of money that way, but she could have gone broke, too. And Hero didn't have a lot of choice in some ways. When his father got sick, the Army and the VA took care of most of his medical bills, but they ran into a lot of expenses anyway, and Hero's mother, who could barely speak English, wasn't equipped to make or handle money on her own. When Hiro's father died, he cashed in all his Black Sun stock to put Mom in a nice community in Korea. She loves it there. Goes golfing every day. He could have kept his money in the Black Sun and made $10 million about a year later when it went public, but his mother would have been a street person. So, when his mother visits him in the metaverse, looking tan and happy in her golfing duds, Hiro views that 
Hero views that as his personal fortune. It won't pay the rent, but that's okay. When you live in a shithole, there's always the metaverse, and in the metaverse, Hero protagonist is a warrior prince. One sec, just getting a quick drink of water here. Gosh. And of course, my cat's going to make the whole process more difficult than it needs to be, but this is fine. So now we learn some relationship background about our, our boy hero protagonist. And we're about to have um, further, not so much background, but uh, plot developments. The plot is about to get rolling. It has not been rolling up until now, but it's about to start moving. Okay. Yes, good. I know. You need this number, I understand. Chapter 8 His tongue is stinging. He realizes that, back in reality, he has forgotten to swallow his beer. It's ironic that Juanita has come into this place in a low-tech, black-and-white avatar. She was the one who figured out a way to make avatars show something close to real emotion. That is a fact Hero has never forgotten, because she did most of her work when they were together, and whenever an avatar looks surprised or angry or passionate in the metaverse, he sees an echo of himself or Juanita, the Adam and Eve of the metaverse. Makes it hard to forget. Shortly after Juanita and Defyvid got divorced, the Black Sun really took off. And once they got done counting their money, marketing the spin-offs, soaking up the adulation of others in the hacker community, they all came to the realization that what made this place a success was not the collision avoidance algorithms or the bouncer demons or any of that other stuff. It was Juanita's faces. Just ask the businessmen in the Nipponese quadrant. They come here to talk turkey with suits from around the world, and they consider it just as good as a face-to-face. -face they more or less ignore what is being said. A lot gets lost in translation, after all. They pay attention to the facial expressions and body language of the people they are talking to. And that's how they know what's going on inside a person's head, by condensing fact from the vapor of nuance. Juanita refused to analyze this process, insisted that it was something ineffable, something you couldn't explain with words. A radical, rosary-toting Catholic, she has no problems with that kind of thing. But the bitheads didn't like it, said it was irrational mysticism. So she quit and took a job with some Nipponese company. They don't have any problem with irrational mysticism, as long as it makes money. But Juanita never comes to the Black Sun anymore. Partly, she's pissed at Defyvid and the other hackers who never appreciated her work. But she has also decided that the whole thing is bogus. That no matter how good it is, the metaverse is distorting the way people talk to each other, and she wants no such distortion in her relationships. Defyvid notices Hero, indicates with a flick of his eyes that this is not a good time. Normally, such subtle gestures are lost in the system's noise, but Defyvid has a very good personal computer, and Juanita helped design his avatar. So the message comes through like a shot fired into the ceiling. Hero turns away, saunters around the big circular bar in a slow orbit. Most of the 64 bar stools are filled with lower-level industry people, getting together in twos and threes, doing what they do best, gossip and intrigue. So I get together with the director for a story conference. He's got this beach house. Incredible. Don't get me started. I heard. Debbie was there for a party when Frank and Mitzi owned it. Anyway, there's this scene early when the man, main character wakes up in a dumpster. The idea is to show how, you know, how despondent he is. That crazy energy. Exactly. Fabulous. I like it. 
Well, he wants to replace it with a scene where the guy is out in the desert with a bazooka, blowing up gold cars in an abandoned junkyard. You're kidding. So we're sitting there on this fucking patio over the beach, and he's going like, Woom, woom, imitating this goddamn bazooka. He's thrilled by the idea. I mean, this is a man who wants to put a bazooka in a movie. So I think I talked him out of it. Nice scene. But you're right. A bazooka doesn't do the same thing as a dumpster. Hero pauses long enough to get this down, then keeps walking. He mumbles, Big Board, again, recalls the magic map, pinpoints his own location, and then reads off the name of this nearby screenwriter. Later on, he could do a search of industry publications to find out what script this guy is working on, hence the name of this mystery director with a fetish for bazookas. Since this whole conversation has come to him via his computer, he's just taken an audio tape of the whole thing. Later, he can process it to disguise the voices, then upload it to the library, cross-referenced under the director's name. A hundred struggling screenwriters will call this conversation up, listen to it over and over until they've got it memorized, paying Hero for the privilege, and within a few weeks, bazooka scripts will flood the director's office. Woo! The Rockstar Quadrant is almost too bright to look at. Rockstar avatars have the hairdos that rock stars can only wear in their dreams. Hero scans it briefly to see if any of his friends are in there, but it's mostly parasites and has-beens. Most of the people Hero knows are will-bees or wannabes. The Movie Star Quadrant is easier to look at. Actors love to come here because in the black sun, they always look as good as they do in the movies. And unlike a bar or club in reality, they can get into this place without physically having to leave their mansion, hotel suite, ski lodge, private airline cabin, or whatever. They can strut their stuff and visit with their friends without any exposure to kidnappers, paparazzi, script flingers, assassins, ex-spouses, autograph brokers, process servers, psycho fans, marriage proposals, or gossip columnists. He gets up off the bar stool and resumes his slow orbit, scanning the Nipponese quadrant. It's a lot of guys in suits, as usual. Some of them are talking to gringos from the industry, and a large part of the quadrant, in the back corner, has been screened off by a temporary partition. Big board again. Hero figures out which tables are behind the partition, starts reading off the names. The only one he recognizes immediately is an American. L. Bob Reif, the television, the cable television monopolist, a very big name to the industry, though he's rarely seen. He seems to be meeting with a whole raft of big Nipponese honchos. Hero has his computer memorize their names so that, later, he can check them against the CIC database and find out who they are. It has the look of a big and important meeting. Secret Agent Hero, how are you doing? Hero turns around. Juanita is right behind him, standing out in her black-and-white avatar, looking good anyway. "'How are you?' she asks. "'Fine. How are you?' "'Great. I hope you don't mind talking to me in this ugly facts-of-life avatar.' "'Juanita, I would rather look at a fax of you than most other women in the flesh.' "'Thanks, you sly bastard.' It's been a long time since we've talked, she observes, as though there's something remarkable about this. Something is going on. I hope you're not going to mess around with Snow Crash, she says. Da Fivid won't listen to me. What am I, a model of self-restraint? I'm exactly the kind of guy who would mess around with it. I know you better than that. You're impulsive, but you're very clever. You have those sword-fighting reflexes. What does that have to do with drug abuse? It means you can see bad things coming and deflect them. It's an instinct, not a learned thing. As soon as you turned around and saw me, that look came over your face, like, what's going on? What the hell is Juanita up to? I didn't think you talked to people in the metaverse. I do if I want to get through to someone in a hurry, she says, and I'll always talk to you. Why me? You know. Because of us. Remember? Because of our relationship? When I was writing this thing? You and I are the only two people who can ever have an honest conversation in the metaverse. 
You're just the same mystical crank you always were, he sm says, smiling so as to make this a charming statement. You can't imagine how mystical and cranky I am now, hero. How mystical and cranky are you? She eyes him warily, exactly the same way she did when he came into her office years ago. It comes into his mind to wonder why she is always so alert in his presence. In college, he used to think that she was afraid of his intellect, but he's known for years that this is the last of her worries. At Black Sun Systems, he figured that it was just a typical female guardedness. Juanita was afraid he was trying to get her into the sack. But this, too, is pretty much out of the question. At this late date in his romantic career, he is just canny enough to come up with a new theory. She's being careful because she likes him. She likes him in spite of herself. He is exactly the kind of tempting but utterly wrong romantic choice that a smart girl like Juanita must learn to avoid. That's definitely it. There's something to be said for getting older. By way of answering his question, she says, I have an associate I'd like you to meet. A gentleman and a scholar named Lagos. He's a fascinating guy to talk to. Is he your boyfriend? She thinks this one over rather than lashing out instantaneously. My behavior at the Black Sun, to the contrary, I don't fuck every male I work with. And even if I did, Lagos is out of the question. Not your type? Not by a long shot. What is your type, anyway? Old, rich, unimaginative blondes with steady careers. This one almost slips by him. Then he catches it. Well, I could dye my hair, and I'll get old, eventually. She actually laughs. It's a tension-releasing kind of outburst. Believe me, hero, I'm the last person you want to be involved with at this point. Is this, uh, part of your church thing? he asks. Juanita has been using her excess money to start her own branch of the Catholic Church. She considers herself a missionary to the intelligent atheists of the world. Don't be condescending, she says. That's exactly the attitude I'm fighting. Religion is not for simpletons. Sorry. This is unfair, you know. You can read every expression on my face, and I'm looking at you through a fucking blizzard. It's definitely related to religion, she says. But this is so complex, and your background in that area is so deficient, I don't know where to begin. Hey, I went to church every week in high school. I sang in the choir. I know. That's exactly the problem. Ninety-nine percent of everything that goes on in most Christian churches has nothing whatsoever to do with the actual religion. Intelligent people all notice this sooner or later, and they conclude that the entire one hundred percent is bullshit, which is why atheism is connected with being intelligent in people's minds. So, none of that stuff I learned in church has anything to do with what you're talking about? Juanita thinks for a while, eyeing him. Then she pulls a hypercard out of her pocket. Here, take this. As Hero pulls it from her hand, the hypercard changes from a jittery two-dimensional figment into a realistic, cream-colored, finely textured piece of stationery. Printed across its face in glossy black ink is a pair of words. Bob L. in Focalypse. And that's Babel like the tower, and Infocalypse like Apocalypse if you put info in front of the Apa, the Ap, or the Collapse. Infocalypse. Infocalypse? And I'm pretty sure it's Bob L, as opposed to Babel, as opposed to Babel. Bob L. Babel. Hence the root of Babel. But Bob L. Because they like emphasizing their words down there in Egypt land. <clears throat> There's enough uh, cartoonish racism in this book. Well, it's it's not racism. It's just stereotyping. Um, and you've already noticed some of it. And I sort of dodged a bullet on that. Uh, <laughs> by not putting two and two together. I was like, ah, nobody could be that obvious. But they are. And it's okay. 
Uh, let's see. Where are we? I just lost my page because I'm a goof. Mm. Ah, thirsty. It's dry in here. It is wet outside. It might as well be spring where I am, even though it's clearly trying to be winter. Alrighty. <clears throat> Me throat. Tea tainted with coffee. What's wrong with me? Okay. Yeah, we got time for another chapter. We should be good. Yeah. Yeah, it should be fine. That should take about that amount of time. Okay, so yeah, we're doing this roughly in five chapter chunks. Give or take. Chapter 9. The world freezes and grows dim for a second. The black sun loses its smooth animation and begins to move in a fuzzy stop action. Clearly, his computer has just taken a major hit. All of its circuits are busy processing a huge bolus of data, the contents of the hypercard, and don't have time to redraw the image of the black sun in its full breathtaking fidelity. Holy shit, he says, when the black sun pops back into full animation again. What the hell is in this card? You must have half the library in here. And a librarian to boot, Juanita says, to help you sort through it. And lots of videotapes of L. Bob Reif, which accounts for most of the bites. Well, I'll try to have a look at it, he says dubiously. Do. Unlike Defivit, you're just smart enough to benefit from this. And in the meantime, stay away from Raven. And stay away from Snow Crash, okay? Who's Raven? he asks. But Juanita is already on her way out the door. The fancy avatars all turn around to watch her as she goes past them. The movie stars give her drop-dead looks. And the hackers purse their lips and stare reverently. Hero orbits back around to the hacker quadrant. Defivid's shuffling hypercards around on his table. Business stats on the Black Sun, film and video clips, hunks of software, scrawled telephone numbers. There's a little blip in the operating system that hits me right in the gut every time you come in the door, Defivid says. I always have this premonition that the Black Sun is headed for a crash. Must be big board, Hero says. It has one routine that patches some of the traps in low memory for a moment. Ah, that's it. Please, please, throw that thing away, Defivid says. What, big board? Yeah, it was totally rad at one point, but now it's like trying to work on a fusion reactor with a stone axe. Thanks. I'll give you all the headers you need if you want to update it to something a little less uh, dangerous, Defivid says. I wasn't impugning your abilities, I'm just saying you need to keep up with the times. It's fucking hard, Hero says. There's no place for a freelance hacker anymore. You have to have a big corporation behind you. I'm aware of that, and I'm aware that you can't stand to work for a big corporation. That's why I'm saying I'll give you the stuff you need. You're always a part of the Black Sun to me, Hero, even since we parted ways. It is classic to Fivid. If he, he's talking with his heart again, bypassing his head. If Defivid weren't a hacker, Hero would despair of his ever having enough brains to do anything. Let's talk about something else, Hero says. Was I just hallucinating, or are you and Juanita on speaking terms again? Defivid gives him an indulgent smile. He has been very kind to Hero ever since the conversation several years back. It was a conversation that started out as a friendly chat over beer and oysters between a couple of long-time comrades-in-arms. It was not until three-quarters of the way through the conversation that it dawned on Hero that he was, in fact, being fired at this very moment. 
Since the conversation, Defyvid has been known to feed Hero useful bits of intel and gossip from time to time. Fishing for something useful? Defyvid asks knowingly. Like many bitheads, Defyvid is utterly guileless, but at times like this, he thinks he's the reincarnation of Machiavelli. I've got news for you, man, Hero says. Most of the stuff you give me, I never put into the library. Why not? Hell, I give you all my best gossip. I thought you were making money off that stuff. I just can't stand it, Hero says, taking parts of my private conversations and whoring them out. Why do you think I'm broke? There's another thing he doesn't mention, which is that he's always considered himself to be Defyvid's equal, and he can't stand the idea of feeding off Defyvid's little crumbs and tidbits, like a dog curled up under his table. I was glad to see Juanita come in here, even as a black and white, Defyvid says, for her not to use the black sun. It's like Alexander Graham Bell refusing to use the telephone. Why did she come in tonight? Something's bugging her, Defyvid says. She wanted to know if I'd seen certain people on the street. Anyone in particular? She's worried about a really large guy with a long black hair, Defyvid says, peddling something called, get this, Snow Crash. Has she tried the library? Yeah, I assume so anyway. Have you seen this guy? Oh yeah, it's not hard to find him. Defyvid says. He's right outside the door. I got this from him. Defyvid scans the table, picks up one of the hypercards, and shows it to Hero. Snow Crash. Tear this card in half to release your free sample. Defyvid, Hero says. I can't believe you took a hypercard from a black and white person. Defyvid laughs. <laughs> this is not the old days, my friend. I've got so much antiviral medicine in my system that nothing could get through. I get so much contaminated shit from all the hackers who come through here, it's like working in a plague ward. So I'm not afraid of whatever's in this hypercard. Well, in that case, I'm curious, Hero says. Yeah, me too, Defyvid laughs. It's probably something very disappointing. Probably an animersal, Defyvid agrees. Think I should do it? Yeah, go for it. It's not every day you get to try out a new drug, Hero says. Well, you could try one every day if you want to, Defyvid says, but it's not every day that you find one that can't hurt you. He picks up the hypercard and tears it in half. For a second, nothing happens. I'm waiting, Defyvid says. An avatar materializes on the table in front of Defyvid starting out ghostly and transparent, gradually becoming solid and three-dimensional. It's a really trite effect. Hero and Defyvid are already laughing. The Avatar is a stark, naked brandy. It doesn't even look like the standard brandy. It looks like one of the cheap Taiwanese brandy knockoffs. Clearly, it's just a daemon. She is holding a pair of tubes in her hands, about the size of paper towel rolls. Defyvid is leaning back in his chair, enjoying this. There's something hilariously tawdry about the entire scene. The brandy leans forward, beckoning Defyvid toward her. Defyvid leans into her face, grinning broadly. She puts her crude, ruby-red lips up by his ear and mumbles something that Hero can't hear. When she leans back away from Defyvid, his face has changed. He looks dazed and expressionless. Maybe Defyvid really looks that way. Maybe Snowcrash has messed up his avatar somehow so that it's no longer tracking Defyvid's true facial expressions. But he's staring straight ahead, eyes frozen in their sockets. The brandy holds up the pair of tubes in front of Defyvid's immobilized face and spreads them apart. It's actually a scroll. She's unrolling it right in front of Defyvid's face, spreading it apart like a flat, two-dimensional screen in front of his eyes. Defyvid's paralyzed face has taken on a bluish tinge, as it reflects light coming out of the scroll. Hero walks around the table to take a look. He gets a brief glimpse of the scroll before the brandy snaps it shut again. It is a living wall of light, like a flexible, flat-screen television set, and it's not showing anything at all, just static. 
white noise. Snow. Then she's gone, leaving no trace behind. Desultory, sarcastic applause sounds from a few tables in the hacker quadrant. Defyvid's back to normal, wearing a grin that's part snide and part embarrassed. What was it? Hero says. I just glimpsed some snow at the very end. You saw the whole thing? Defyvid says. A fixed pattern of black and white pixels, fairly high resolution. Just a few hundred thousand ones and zeros for me to look at. So, in other words, someone just exposed your optic nerve to, what, maybe a hundred thousand bytes of information, Hero says. Noise is more like it. Well, all information looks like noise until you break the code, Hero says. Why would anyone show me information in binary code? I'm not a computer. I can't read a bitmap. Relax, Defive it. I'm just shitting you, Hero says. You know what it was? You know how hackers are always trying to show me samples of their work? Yeah? Some hacker came up with this scheme to show me his stuff. And everything worked fine until the moment the brandy opened the scroll. But his code was buggy, and it snow crashed at the wrong moment, so instead of seeing his output, all I saw was snow. Then why did he call the thing snow crash? Gallo's humor. He knew it was buggy. What did the brandy whisper in your ear? Some language I didn't recognize, the Fivid says. Just a bunch of babble. Babble. Babel. Afterwards, you looked sort of stunned. Defyvid looks resentful. I wasn't stunned. I just found the whole experience so weird. I guess I was just taken aback for a second. Hero is giving him an extremely dubious look. Defyvid notices it and stands up. Want to go see what your competitors in Nippon are up to? What competitors? You used to design avatars for rock stars, right? Still do. Well, Sushi K is here tonight. Oh, yeah, the hairdo the size of a galaxy. You can see the rays from here, Defyvid says, waving toward the next quadrant, but I want you to see the whole getup. It does look as though the sun is rising somewhere in the middle of the Rockstar quadrant. Above the heads of the milling avatars, Hero can see a fan of orange beams radiating outward from some point in the middle of the crowd. It keeps moving, turning around, shaking from side to side, and the whole universe seems to move with it. On the street, the full radiance of Sushi K's rising sun hairdo is suppressed by the height and width regulations. But Defyvid allows free expression inside the black sun, so the orange rays extend all the way to the property lines. I wonder if anyone's told him yet that Americans won't buy rap music from a Japanese person. Hero says as they stroll over there. Maybe you should tell him, Defyvid suggests. Charge him for the service. He's in L.A. right now, you know. Probably staying in a hotel full of bootlickers telling him what a big star he's going to be. He needs to be exposed to some, in some actual biomass. They inject themselves into a stream of traffic, winding a narrow channel through a rift in the crowd. Biomass? Defyvid says. A body of living stuff. It's an ecology term. If you take an acre of rainforest or a cubic mile of ocean or a square block of Compton and strain out all the on... Wait a minute. And strain out all of the living stuff, dirt, all of the non-living stuff, there's a typo in the book, all of the non-living stuff, dirt and water, you get the biomass. Defyvid, ever the bithead, says... I do not understand. His voice sounds funny. There's a lot of white noise creeping into his audio. Industry expression, Hero says. The industry feeds off the human biomass of America, like a whale straining krill from the sea. Hero wedges himself between a couple of Nipponese businessmen. One is wearing a uniform blue, but the other is a neo-traditional, wearing a dark kimono. And, like Hero, he's wearing two swords, the long katana on his left hip, and the one-handed wakizashi stuck horizontally, diagonally, rather, in his waistband. He and Hero glance cursorially at each other's armaments. Then Hero looks away and pretends not to notice, 
while the neo-traditional is freezing solid, except for the corners of his mouth, which are curling downward. Hero has seen this kind of thing before. He knows he's about to get into a fight. People are moving out of the way. Something big and inexorable is plunging through the crowd, shoving avatars this way and that. Only one thing has the ability to shove people around like that inside the Black Sun, and that's a bouncer daemon. As they get closer, Hero sees that it's a whole flying wedge of them, gorillas in tuxedos. Real gorillas, and they seem to be headed toward Hero. He tries to back away, but he quickly runs into something. It looks like Big Board finally got him in trouble. He's on his way out of the bar. Defy vid, Hero says. Call him off, man. I'll stop using it. All of the people in his vicinity are staring over Hero's shoulder, their faces illuminated by a stew of brilliant colored lights. Hero turns around to look at Defyvid. But Defyvid's not there anymore. Instead of Defyvid, there is just a jittering cloud of bad digital karma. It's so bright and fast and meaningless that it hurts to look at. It flashes back and forth from color to black and white, and when it's in color, it rolls wildly around the color wheel, as though it's being strafed with high-powered disco lights. And it's not staying within its own body space. Hair-thin pixel lines keep shooting off to one side, passing all the way across the black sun and out through the wall. It's not so much an organized body as it is a centrifugal cloud of lines and polygons whose center cannot hold, throwing bright bits of body shrapnel all over the room, interfering with people's avatars, flickering and disappearing. The gorillas don't mind. They shove their long, furry fingers into the midst of the disintegrating cloud and latch onto it somehow and carry it past Hero, toward the exit. Hero looks down as it goes past him and sees what looks very much like Defyvid's face as viewed through a pile of shattered glass. It's just a momentary glimpse. Then the avatar is gone, expertly drop-kicked out the front door, soaring out over the street in a long, flat arc that takes it over the horizon. Hero looks up the aisle to see Defyvid's table, empty, surrounded by stunned hackers. Some of them are shocked. Some of them are trying to stifle grins. Defyvid Meyer, Supreme Hacker Overlord, Founding Father of the Metaverse Protocol, Creator and Proprietor of the world-famous Black Sun, has just suffered a system crash. He's been thrown out of his own bar by his own daemons. All right, and that, I think, is going to have to do it for today. Yes, yes, it is. Um, let me just double check where's... Eh. Eh. There, okay. Yes, I am going to have to call it for today. Um, hopefully next week... There will be A, less interruptions, and B, I can do a larger chunk. That would be nice. I uh, hope you folks are enjoying this. Uh, I do do this every week. Um, same time, Saturdays at noonish, um, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I also have other streams throughout the week. I have a Mecha Monday stream where I do something giant robot related or adjacent uh and then on wednesdays i do a warframe centric stream um all at the same times uh time frame roughly noon uh eastern standard time on those days uh if you're watching this recorded great uh hope you're enjoying um i do actually have to do some house cleaning and get uh uh make sure that i've got the um organization set up for these i think i have been lax in that for the past two or three weeks so i will get that all taken care of um but yeah hopefully people are enjoying these if they're not oh well uh if they are great uh feel free to send me a line and give me a holler be like hey this is awesome or hey you're shit i don't care feedback F any feedback is good as far as i'm concerned any feedback at all so yeah thanks for tuning